plants are cool. And we have another chance to learn a little bit more about plants and systematics today, even though we're not in session. So we're going to continue today with our discussion of the history of taxonomy by talking about the first of uh, several schools, specifically three schools of taxonomy. Now I know it's kind of weird to think about schools of science. Perhaps we're more used to thinking about schools of art or something like that. Now, not schools of science, but there are schools also in science. There are certain kind of agreed upon ways of doing things among certain scientists. And those scientists think that those ways of doing things that they have developed and within their group, sometimes quite a very large group of people could be scattered all over the whole world. But the ways that those people do things, those are the right ways. And the way the other people do things, those are the wrong ways. And those are kind of the definitions of the schools. And in systematics, <clears throat> we see very, very clear examples of uh, schools of thought. And these schools of thought have proceeded from each other in kind of historical sequence until bringing us to where we are today. In a way, we don't have a school so much today as a bunch of techniques, but you'll see it was very where we are today and how we think about classification of organisms is very influenced by the past. So what are these schools of systematics? So that there are three basic schools we're going to talk about, and perhaps there could be sub-schools within these, but we're just going to talk about them in this historical sequence. The first one is called evolutionary systematics. Or it's also called, and perhaps more commonly called, and I'm going to call it more I'll use this other term more in this class, classical taxonomy. And that's the subject of our lecture today, after some more introductory remarks. Classical taxonomy is the most diffuse of the schools, the least, the hardest one to define, the least well-defined, and the one that extended over the most uh, period of time. In some ways you could say classical taxonomy went all the way back to Aristotle or Theophrastus and extended up until the through the 19th and into the 20th century. So you can imagine something a way of classification of organisms that lasted that long um, would have a very kind of diffuse and generalized principles, not really codified principles. The first school that's really got very clearly codified principles followed classical taxonomy, and in some cases, uh, some opinions, you might say, uh, replaced it, and that is the school of phonetics. And the word pheno means to show, or the root pheno to show, and so Phonetics is about the appearances of plants and how the appearances of plants really govern how they should be classified. And already with phonetics, you probably should be thinking of people like um, John Ray and Michael Adamson, who were the inspirations for this school, even though they both of those taxonomists kind of fit within classical taxonomy the principles that they started to develop, the principles of looking at many characteristics and equally weighed characteristics, really became central to this school of phonetics. And we'll talk about that, not today, but in a later lecture. And the third school of taxonomy is called phylogenetic systematics. or more colloquially and more commonly, and probably I will call it more commonly this in class, cladistics. And we'll talk about that name, phylogenetic systematics, and cladistics as we go on, um, probably not today, but later on in the lecture on phylogenetic systematics. Phylogenetic systematics really replaced phonetics, uh, starting probably around 1960, but not really gaining full acceptance until 
the mid 80s, perhaps early 80s, maybe early 80s, the mid 80s, and consists continues today in modified forms in the way we think about how organisms could be classified. The principles by which the schools operated are really very different from each other, um, so different that we can call them schools. So we will start to consider those kinds of, of things and some of the representatives of the different schools as we go on. Let's first of all think about what some of the differences are between these different schools, and at least the differences that we're going to consider here. I'm not saying that these are the only differences, but these are the ones that we're going to consider. So the first really big difference is about how characters are used. how characters are defined and used in classification. You got a little bit of a sense of this from the beginning of our talk of history. If you think back to Theophrastus and how Theophrastus defined characteristics, right? Gross morphology is what he was using. Um, and then you think about someone like uh, John Ray who started to say all the characteristics of the plant should be used in their classification you can get a little bit of a feeling that different people have approached this idea that how the characteristics of the plant should be considered in quite different ways. Now the schools are going to have really even bigger differences than I've just outlined between Theophrastus and John Ray. Those guys are still both basically classical taxonomists. When we start to talk about the phoneticists and the um, cladists, you'll see that they have really fundamental different ways about how they think about characters. Uh, phen phen phoneticists are going to say that all characters are equal, following Addison in that, and classical and uh, Cladeus are going to say that characters are not all equal, and that some characters are better, uh, more informative, in that sense, better than other kinds of characteristics. So how characters are defined and used in classification, that's our first big difference between these different schools. Second big difference is how um, where they define monophyly. So you know about monophyletic as the way that we've been talking about it in this class and the way that everyone talks about it today. The definition is hard to say in words, but you know that you make that one cut on the phylogenetic tree. And if you can lift off your group with one cut of, the, of a branch of the tree, that group is monophyletic. As we define monophyletic today, we are using a cladistic def definition of monophyletic. We are all cladists to some extent today. The phoneticists and the classical taxonomists had very different ideas, especially the classical taxonomists had very different ideas of what monophyly meant. And we'll talk about that. We'll start talking about that today, in fact, when we talk about as we talk about classical taxonomy. So this word monophyly has not always meant the same thing. It's meant very different things. And there were huge disagreements between the classical taxonomists and the cladists about what monophyly should mean almost coming to blows in some cases at, at conferences. So the very, very passionately held different ideas about what this word should mean. Third, a um, really strong difference between the different schools is how they used fossils. I'm going to say the treatment of fossils. Now this one's probably going to seem the word the word the strangest of all these three to you because it just seems completely obvious that fossils must be the ancestors of extant organisms organisms that exist today. It's not that obvious. That isn't quite ob as obvious as you might think, and I'm going to try to convince you as we go along with these lectures that it isn't so that point of view is not so obvious. That point of view, in fact, is a classical taxon taxonomic point of view. 
it seemed obvious to them that we should be looking at ancestors when we look at fossils. That's what we should be seeing, and we're going to talk about that some today, about how a classical taxonomist saw ancestors. So it's going to seem kind of familiar, what you would normally say. It's kind of the common sense way that fossils would be viewed. Fossils are not viewed that way in the same in cladistics. There's a very different way that they're viewed and used in cladistics and used in, in studies today. Um, if you've encountered any well, you probably wouldn't have in this if you're in this class now, but if you'd had encountered any contemporary papers about how fo uh, that, that treat how fossils are used in systematic studies, you would see that they are not being treated as ancestors. They're being used in a very different way. And we'll come we'll talk about that as we go on. And phoneticists also have a very different way of thinking about fossils. Phoneticists really don't they're not fossils are not ancestors, or at least not obviously ancestors to a phoneticist. And the fourth way in which the school is different is how taxa are delimited. I'm going to say delimitation of taxa. Or we could also say circumscription. And we've talked about this word circumscription before. So, you know, we, we imagine that there is a set of individual organisms out there in the world, right? And how are we going to divide those organisms up into taxa? Well, it turns out the schools are quite different in what they say about how we should divide them up so that, you know, some schools might put these things well, I made those overlapping. We can't do that, right? Something like that. And another school might say we should divide these things up in a very different way. I'm just going to circle them all now for this. So circumscription really means drawing circles around. Now, we're going to talk about circumscription in a very different way than this diagram indicates right now. I just bring the diagram on the screen at this point so that you will remember that circumscription means drawing circles about. And so what we're going to do, look at in these different schools of taxonomy is we're going to look at ways in which um, scientists have taken the raw data, whatever that means, we'll talk about what raw data means too, taken the raw data and manipulated it to get some idea about evolutionary history and then how they've translated that information about inf evolutionary history into a classification. That is, a circumscription of taxa would be a classification of those taxa in some way. So we'll look at that in the different schools of taxonomy. So here we are with today's subject, evolutionary systematics or classical taxonomy. So, you know, I said this went all the way back to Theophrastus, classical taxonomy, but we're not going to talk about it, the principles as going back quite that far. We have talked already about Theophrastus and all the people before him, um, not before him, but all the people after Theophrastus up until the Renaissance and through the Renaissance up until Darwin. And uh, that was in our lecture on the history of systematics. Now we're going to kind of focus on post-Darwinian time. So this is always going to be evolutionary. So when we talk about classical taxonomy or evolutionary systematics, it's always post-Darwinian. So what a classical taxonomist then wanted to do following Darwin, is incorporate evolution into their classifications. And they were faced with this big problem of how do we classify according to evolution, or how do we use evolution to classify organisms. And perhaps I should say, how do we use the theory of evolution to classify and we've already talked about a little bit that you know the first people who really did this really kind of substituted 
evolution for God. You know, the categories that they that they discovered would have been seen as been divinely created at one point, and then after the Darwinian revolution, they were seen as arising because of evolution, and there was just kind of this replacement in people's minds, scientists' minds, between God and evolution. Things. Um, so that was kind of an early history of how this did, kind of this unconscious just simply replacing it. Because, and I think that that was probably the case because we were still in the process of developing techniques that we could really use to uncover the paths of evolution, the paths that evolutionary history had followed in the evolution of the organisms. And so what we're going to see as we go through these different schools of taxonomy is a progressive development of techniques that allowed us to uncover how evolution worked more. And this is going to be a big difference then between the phoneticists and the cladists. The cladists are going to claim that evolution is the most important thing and we have techniques now, we understand techniques that are going to let us un uncover patterns of evolutionary history. And the phoneticists are going to say evolution is really important and gosh we wish we had techniques that we could un uncover evolutionary history but we don't. We'll come back we'll come back to that. So this idea of how the, the first began then with the classical taxonomists was the problem of how do we use evolution to classify organisms and they started to um, struggle with this and come up with an ideas. Now when I say they started to struggle with it I mean that there was a whole bunch of people working in these areas and we'll talk about some of them some more in just a minute. But there was no one seminal person, no one seminal book that kind of defined this area of classical taxonomy. In both phonetics and cladistics, there's going to be one central person who starts it all and writes a very important book that defined those. Well, actually in phonetics, it's two, two different people. In phonetics, a co-authored book. In classical, in a cladistics, it's one person. We'll get their names later. In classical taxonomy, there's no one person. There's a whole bunch of different people who are working. And they worked in very different kinds of ways. I'll name a couple of them here for, um, you know one already, for at least part of his name, Arthur Cronquist. In pl working in plants. Um, Working in zoology, um, Ernst Marr. George Simpson. Uh, Ernst Marr was a systematist and um, interested in, or an evolutionary biologist and systematist, worked a lot in evolutionary theory. George Simpson was a paleontologist. They were both at um, Harvard and uh, worked very closely together. Well, closely together, let's say. Uh, Cronquist had a number of different positions, but worked in producing a classification of plants. Now, these are people who are kind of the generation before, just the generation before mine. So, as I was studying, they were very well established and the aging statesmen of evolutionary theory and classical taxonomy. Um, we'll talk about some other people who, be, who were from an earlier time in just a minute. The point I wanted to make about these people was that they didn't share an ex any explicit philosophical so assumptions as classical taxonomists. So there were no explicit assumptions about how to do taxonomy by any really any of these people. So let's say philosophical assumptions or we could even say methods Um, 
no agreed upon best methods for how to do cla um, classification across all of the different people. Now the really important thing that about what I've just said is that these uh, assumptions or methods did not cross individuals. So individuals might have made assumptions, but there were no assumptions that defined the school. Excuse me about that. I lost my pen. Okay, so individuals took a, an approach to the classification of organisms. Like Cronquist had this very individualistic approach to how he put together higher level classifications of organisms, higher le meaning uh, above the family level, or at least family level and above, but mainly he was concerned about how the different families fit together in orders, how the orders fit together into subclasses, etc., those kinds of things. And if you recall, one of the striking things about Cronquist's um, system, and one of the reasons it got some attention, was it agreed pretty well with Toctajan's system. And the fact it got attention because of this, because it was so unusual. People didn't agree with each other on the classification of organisms. It was very individualistic. So classical taxonomy, you know, we're saying it's a school, but in fact it was a, really a lot of these individuals, and the classifications tended to be individualistic. Okay, you noticed we had a little problem there. The screen just jumped, and I can't go back and fix that, unfortunately. So we've lost a little bit of text that was on the screen. I was about to say that the classifications are individualistic. So the whole school of classical taxonomy is individualistic. So the individuals, then, like Cronquist, develop their own systems, which may or may not, usually not, agreed with someone else's kinds of system. So individuals made assumptions about evolu how evolution had taken place. but they may have differed between different individuals. Let's go and talk a little bit about um, Engler and Engler's system of classification. You remember Engler and Brontal, the big um, authors of very important works on the classification of plants, uh, Natural and Plants and Familien, for instance, and how these classification systems have been used to organize herbaria around the world, Chapel Hill Herbarium being one of those examples. Now, Engler and Prantl made assumptions about what the primitive kinds of plants were. And their assumptions have not turned out to be very accurate on this, but they based their whole, assum that their whole, ba their whole system based on these kinds of assumptions. Now, I don't want to make it sound like they just made these things up, even though I'm kind of tending that way, right? They had reasons, and I'll try to explain a little bit about that, why they had reasons for some of these assumptions. So all the scientists had what they felt were justifiable um, reasons for their, what I'm calling, assumptions. 
but different scientists made different assumptions about this. Okay, so let's make this more concrete. One of the assumptions that Angler and Prontel made, Angler we're talking about now, um, was that the catkin-bearing plants were the closest to the gymnosperms. I'm going to say are the most primitive. And that would mean, in this case, the most like the gymnosperms. Well, what's a catkin? So here's one of the plants we're going to be learning very soon, uh, Betula nigra, the uh, river birch. It's a very common plant that is grown in many areas around campus in cultivated areas but it's also a native plant it's nice that we see some native plants planted someplace and if you look here and here you see these two different organizations of sexual parts this is a cluster of female flowers and we have here several clusters of male flowers. So there's clusters of male flowers. The individual flowers are quite small. There's one of them there. And it has no they have no perianth on them, so they're very um, reduced. Basically they're just a bract with a bunch of stamens in there, in the axle of the bract. And we can't even see the flowers on the female side. There's basically a gynecium that's there. Nothing else has been retained of this. So these kinds of clusters of flowers, um, especially those hanging ones there, are called catkins. And if you think about what a pine looks like, and you remember the male cones in the pine, those male cones look a little bit like those catkins on the male side. Now, on the catkins here in Betula, the catkins are hanging and they're upright in pine. But in other um, gymnosperms, they hang a little more than they do in pine, never completely dangling like this. But you see there's a similarity here. There's no perianth. In the, in the gymnosperms, there's no perianth. There's just the sexual parts that are available there. In the female side, there is an ovary in this case. That is, the ovules are surrounded. In the gymnosperm case, there isn't. They're not surrounded. So there's a difference in that respect, but you see the similarity. So there is some reason to think, um, based on this gross, more kind of gross morphology, gross resemblance of these different parts, that the catkins of the this group of plants, I mean, there's a number of plants in the, with related to these things. Um, th these catkin-bearing plants might be closely related to the gymnosperms. And so, when Engler and Prantl were assembling their system, they put the catkin-bearing plants first. So that means that in their book, you'd go through the gymnosperms, and then the next group that you would come to right after the gymnosperms would be the catkin-bearing plants. Those were the most primitive of them. Uh, we don't. We no longer don't think about this this way. We have evidence, molecular evidence, other kinds of morphological evidence that suggests that these plants are derived. The catkin-bearing plants are derived. This is a secondary loss of the perianth here. So the more primitive ones probably had a perianth, and it's been lost in these groups. But uh, we well, we don't agree with Enger in that sense anymore. Here's another example of some uh, catkins, and this in still in the, the same family, but we can see this is a female here, male here, and female here. 
And again, you see that there is a superficial resemblance to what we would expect to see in the gymnosperms, or what we do see in the gymnosperms. Okay, so there's an example of an assumption, right? They based a whole elaborate system, and remember, these guys were not dumb guys. Engler and Prantl are among the greatest botanists who ever lived. They accomplished more in their lives than really just about anyone who's alive today. As I have said, no one has undertaken really a revision of plants on a worldwide basis as, as they did in their time. Well, our second example of someone who's a classical taxonomist is Bessie. And you may already have been thinking about uh, Bessie's dicta. <clears throat> and so these dicta established evolutionary trends. Now, there was, of course, evidence for the dicta. There was evidence from the study of fossils, from the study of comparative morphology, just as there was evidence for anglers uh, thinking that the catkin-bearing plants were the most primitive. But as I've said already, Bessie made these dicta, these evolutionary trends, universal. So here's some examples of uh, Bessie's dicta. Um, these are real things, pretty much in his own words. We looked at a couple different ones in the lecture on history. The first uh, dictum is about bisexual flowers. So bisexual flowers preceded unisexual flowers. Quite the opposite, you notice, of what Engler was saying. and was saying the unisexual flowers, because they're more similar to gymnosperms, came first. By Bessie's time, we had some a little more complete fossil record, and we found these primitive plants um, with perianth parts, which have flowers very similar to magnolias, in the fossil record. And so Bessie decided that this was a general trend um, that applied to all plants. And so if you had a unisexual flowers, you always know um, those were the derived. Unisexual flowers are, are derived. There couldn't be a unisexual flower that was primitive. And the unisexual flowers were derived by reduction from the bisexual flowers through the loss of parts. Stamens, this is a really famous one. It got a lot of attention for many years. Numerous stamens, think of Ranunculaceae or Papaveraceae or Magnoliaceae. Uh, Magnolia is a really famous um, example of a plant that comes out primitive on very many of Bessie's uh, dicta. And so Magnolia, at the time when I was studying, was the one of the archetypal plants that was taken as a primitive type of plant. Um, not the only one, but a very primitive type of, of plant, magnolia. Numerous stamens, that's more primitive than with few stamens. So if you've got five stamens, six stamens, those kinds of things, those are all derived characteristics. Spirally arranged stamens also would be, because numerous stamens are always spirally arranged. There's also the spiral arrangement of leaves. So this spiral arrangement of leaves would be alternate leaf arrangement. That's also another word that we call this. And a word that you're familiar with from uh, the keys. So that's primitive, precedes, opposite worlds of leaves on this. So some examples of, Be of Bessie's dic dicta. Thanks. Again, we don't accept these as general trends today. I mean, it... In most cases, we do find that bisexual flowers preceded unisexual flowers, but just the fact that you've got a unisexual flower in your hand does not tell you that it is a derived condition. You can't always assume that. You can't always say that every bisexual flower is, uh, is primitive. It may be that there has been a, a complex evolution in certain groups where you've... Um, started with bisexual flowers, you produced unisexual flowers, and bisexual flowers evolved again within that, within that group. There's multiple kinds of reversals like this 
um, are possible according to current thought and evidences. And so you can't make the, these dicta that are very simple like this and give a unidirectional um, indications like Bessie's dicta do are not are not well accepted. And this change has really happened in my lifetime. At the time I started studying, um, Bessie's dicta were still very influential. And if you look in the older textbooks, you will still, older systematic textbooks, you'll still find them uh, quite commonly used. Okay, let's talk about fossils. We've talked a little bit of some of the characteristics now of this individualism with kind of using their intuition. I'm not completely ignoring data, but you see the data led Angler and Bessie to very different kinds of conclusions, not strictly drawn on the data. So there was this large intuitive content in there. The individual scientist could interpret the data in their own kind of way. Let's think about how they worked with fossils. Well, as I've already said, evolutionary systematics or, or classical taxonomy says that fossils are direct ancestors. The fossils represent. direct ancestors of present-day species, present-day taxa. Another way of saying this is that fossils can be placed in direct ancestor-descendant relationships with extant taxa. So ancestor gives rise to descendant. Okay, we're going to look at some diagrams that show this in just a minute, but the idea is fossil, ancestor, and this arrow is time. Direct relationship between the fossil and some ancestral species. They have to be related, of course, we're not talking about a plant giving rise to a dinosaur here, but you know what I'm saying. Well, as I have said already, it's going to seem strange to you that I'm calling this an assumption and suggesting now that there's other ways of looking at fossils, but there are and we will get them um, as we go on. For the moment, let's look at some examples of how a classical taxonomist would look at fossils and how they would use fossils in thinking about evolutionary relationships. And one of these ways that we'll consider are uh, chrono species. Kronos, of course, was the Greek titan who was the ruler of time, and so you could think of these as time species. Species that have come about through a evolutionary process over time. So here's the definition. We're going to spend some time to understand this definition. Kronos species is... So it's, first of all, it's a segment of an evolving lineage. Okay, so we've got to have an evolving lineage. We'll have to think about what that means. What's an evolving lineage? This is a part of that evolving lineage. So there's a line, and this is a segment of the line. And that segment of the line is arbitrary. Right, this is a really important, arbitrarily divided segment. So it's not just a segment of the line, it's an arbitrary divided segment. So there's that thing about right classical taxonomy kind of making the uh, uh, individual investigator being able to make through his own intuition 
based on some evidence, but through his, largely through his intuition, an arbitrary division of an evolving lineages. And that's going to create different species. And those species are going to differ from each other morphologically. That is, they're going to look different from each other. And then in the same or different lineages. Uh, let's just leave that aside for right now, but I think we've got the essence of it for right now. So arbitrarily, arbitrarily divided segment of an evolving lineages that differs morphologically from other species. And those species could be in the same lineage or in a different lineage. But as I say, the important part is before that. So the first thing we need to think about is time in this. And I think it helps to have this diagram these are strata, time in these strata flows this way, and so that these are the earlier, and these the later strata. And if you notice here, this artist uh, rendition has shown, you know, very simple organisms down here, trilobites, and up here there's even a human skull. Now, we're not suggesting there's a direct line between trilobites and humans here, but we are trying to say that over these long periods of time, the strata have been, lied, have been laid down in successive beds and that we can see evolutionary change through those strata over time. So we're going to look at some graphs and, and we're going to put on the vertical axis is going to be time in terms of these, you can think of it kind of as these strata appearing on that axis. So here we have one of those axes with time listed here and just our stratigraphic column shown there to remind us that we're talking about geological time here. So we're talking about millions of years going by or at least hundreds of thousands of years, but probably millions of years. And we can divide that time up. We're just dividing it arbitrarily up here into three segments time one, time two, and time three. Um, again, if we were actually doing with real data, we would have some kind of a real chronology on that side, um, either a geological chronology talking about geological ages or a chronology of time. On the other axis, we have morphology. So there's some measure of shape. Let me actually write that, some measure or form, some measure of the shape or form of the organism. This measure of shape or morphology could be all kinds of different things, you know. Um, there's very sophisticated ways and very simple ways of doing this. But all we're trying to get across on this x-axis is that the shape of the organism is changing on that x-axis. So if we see two points, let's just take two points at, oh, that isn't supposed to do that, uh, at time one, right? And we have get morphology along those two points. We see that this point and this point are different in the morph on the morphology axis. And so that means that the organisms look different from each other. So that's all that this is supposed to be doing on the morphology axis. those. You know, sometimes it does it. It takes me to the next slide. And sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so what's this showing? Now, we are trying to illustrate here a chrono species. And that's going to be illustrated over here on the right. Both these diagrams are supposed to represent evolving lineages. So A is really, well, A is technically not evolving, so there's no morphological change. over time in lineage A. 
It's just staying the same over that period of time. In the second group here, we're having morphological change. as indicated by movement on that uh, morphology axis, on the x-axis, over the period of time. And now, because there's morphological change there, we can take and we can separate them, and we're going to just separate them arbitrarily here at time 2. I'm going to grab another color. And so there's our arbitrary separation into two now separate, one, two, or one, two, whichever way, one and two are chrono species. So they are arbitrary segments. We just picked a place and we drew a line there of an evolving lineage. There's that evolving lineage um, that goes from B to C. There it's evolving because the morphology has changed. And um, they are distinct from each other. They're morphologically distinct from each other. They are morphologically distinct B from C, and B and C are distinct from A. So that was that last part of the definition. Let's jump back to morphologically distinct from other species in the same lineage. That's A from B. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. B from C, or in different lineages, that is the A versus B, C, B or C, morphologically distinct. Okay, so that's a chrono species. Our, one of our main points here was that B is the direct ancestor of C. Typical way in which a classical taxonomist would think about evolution. Not, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying this is the way they thought about it and you would find papers and still can find papers that are published along these lines. Mainly this kind of work is done by um, paleontologists, people like Simpson and other people who would talk about these ideas of chrono species. They're not very popular to talk about chrono species today as we'll understand when we get into our discussions of cladistics, but in any case I think we've got a good handle, a start on that. We'll look at another example of kind of a, a chrono species. Um, let's just read through what it says here, and then we'll look at the diagrams and show the same thing. Basically, we're looking at the same kind of ideas shown here. But so, in a chrono species, we've got a lineage, and it evolves over time into a, more, um, a, a distinct form. So, a single lineage evolves over time into a morphologically distinct form, B, center. So, here it is. So, there's our distinct lineage, it's evolving, there's a period of rapid evolution here, and there is a new species, a distinct chrono species. Part of that same lineage is. Now, they go on to show this a little, to go into a little more detail about uh, chrono species and how you would recognize two or one species. They, they're claiming now, the author's claiming, if the connection is recognized, if it's recognized that B is connected with A here, then they'll be seen, signed to a single evolutionary species. So in other words, I'm going to grab another color. For B, this would then be according to this author, this is one interpretation, one species. Now, if the fossil record's incomplete, we might find, here we have here, the same situation as we had in B, 
going to go back to my blue, and we would have really like this. So what we're saying is that the lineage maybe still is looks completely like that, but now there are missing fossils. Or for some reason we're not recognizing that that blue con line is really connecting them, that they are really part of the same lineage. In those cases, now the author says, we would recognize two distinct species. So in that case, we are recognizing two distinct species. And I'm fact, I'm going to erase that blue line now. And we see that with those missing fossils, it really looks like there's no connection between those species. They're morphologically different. They occur at different times. They occur in different stratas. And so A and B regarded as separate species, separate biological species, separate chrono species, if you want to talk about that. And they talk about a pseudo extinction in that in that way because they really are the same species, but they get recognized, kind of my mistake as separate species because we lack some data. So uh, again, what my point is here is again this these are really examples of how classical taxonomists thought about the evolution of species over time, how they thought about fossils, and how fossils interacted with each other, one giving rise to another, or in some cases where there's not enough data recognizing different species, etc., etc. Okay. Um, the important point is to understand this is how they thought about things. These are examples of how they thought about using fossils. It'll only really make sense to you when we go to a, when we start talking about cladistics and phonetics, and we're going to see something completely different. They're going to completely disagree with all of this. They're going to, it's going to be really weird to, to think that there's such a completely different way of think about thinking about how you use fossils. So we're just trying to get a baseline for us here. Monophyletic. A big difference between the different schools is how monophyly is designed. We could say, what is a monophyletic group? And so we've got the same phylogenetic tree drawn here, just so I have a backbone to think about of this, and so I can show you some different examples. We know that today, Today means cladistics. We think about monophyletic groups as being a group that you can remove with one cut of our tin steps. So here we have a monophyletic group. Here we have, oops, my tin steps got a little cut themselves. Here we have a monophyletic group. Here we have a monophyletic group. Pretty straightforward. Easy to understand, if not to say in words, easy to understand. This is not what a classical taxonomist meant by a monophyletic group. They did not like this definition. And they had the first definition. They used this word monophyly. Classical taxonomists had been using it for years, for decades, before Cladus came along and redefined it in the way that we've just, done, we've just shown you. So what did a classical taxonomist think about monophyletic group? Let's grab another color. Let's start with an ancestor. And now let's follow the tree and find the descendants of that ancestor. Here is the descendant of that ancestor. 
Here is a descendant of that ancestor. Here is a descendant of that ancestor. Here is a descendant of that ancestor. They all came from this ancestor, right? So they all had one origin. So this group J is outside that group. That is a monophyletic group. Because they have, they all go back to one origin. So if you can follow up from the base and you can trace your lines like this so that it, you connect all the groups like that, you have a monophyletic group even though it excludes some of the ancestors of that group. Some not, I'm sorry, not some of the ancestors, I apologize. Some of the descendants of that group can be excluded and it could still be a monophyletic group. There's another way we could think about monophyletic groups. Let's continue down here. Here's classical taxonomy again. It's really just another example I'm going to do. This group is monophyletic. So why is it monophyletic? So let's look at the ancestor here and we can trace it up and we see that all of these lineages come from that ancestor and so does this one. G is excluded but that's okay. If we do the cut system, right, we would have to make one cut here and one cut here to get our group that consists of H, I, J, K, L, M. So it would be really be two cuts, so it's not monophyletic under the cladistic definition, but this is the monophyletic under classical taxonomy. It, has, it can be all be traced back to that one ancestor, or in other words, we can follow that one ancestor upwards. So I know this seems strange to you now because we're so used to the other definition, the modern definition, the cladistic definition of monophyletic. But as I said, for decades, monophyletic meant this other thing. It meant this thing where you could trace it from an ancestor like this. They shared, a, all these taxa shared a common ancestor. That was monophyletic. And you can imagine what the classical taxonomist said when the cladist came along and said, oh, by the way, You've got the wrong definition of monophyletic. Monophyletic should not mean what you say that it means and have been using it for all these years. It should mean this other thing that we think now, that we're teaching all of our students now about this one cut method. So the classical taxonomists did not take this lightly. They did not take it easily. They were pretty much really pissed off that this group of young Turks, these Cletus, said that we should um, change the definition of, mon of monophyletic. And so, in fact, the word cladist is going to even come out of this fight. Cladist. We'll come back to this when we talk about the cladist and tell you the origin of the name cladist. So these uh, phylogenetic systematists got to be known as cladists because of this controversy about monophyletic. And we'll make that make more sense later. For now, we just know they've got a completely different definition of monophyletic. So, how are taxa defined? When we look at a phylogenetic tree like this, we can see that in the current way we think about things, we would define our taxa based on monophyletic groups. So, you know, if we wanted to define, um, these are families and oh this is a phylogenetic tree of all of the flowering plants and so you know if we wanted to define groups in here that were at higher taxonomic levels we would look at our monophyletic groups and so here might be one of those higher level taxa defined on a mono, monophyletic group but as you can imagine the uh, classical taxonomists didn't define things this way did not define groups based strictly on monophyly. So 
Let's jump ahead for Cladus in just a minute and say that Cladus Cladus defined higher level taxa based only on monophyletic groups. And of course, that's the cladistic definition of monophyletic, right? We have to be very clear on that. Classical taxonomists define higher level taxa in a slightly different way. They use evolutionary history so a phylogenetic tree like this would be one way of representing evolutionary history and similarity to define the higher level groups Now that's a little hard to show on this diagram, so we'll go on to the next slide and look at that. So this is about how taxa are delimited. And phonetic distance, this is essentially what we were saying before about morphology. So the morphology then and phonetic distance in this diagram mean effectively the same thing. That is, this x-axis here is distinguishing the different, um, how the things appear to each other. So if they're farther apart on the axis, G being farther apart from F or E, so G is different morphologically. It's different on this x-axis from F. It's even more different from E. It's even more different from D. Right, so this is a measure of, this axis is a measure of the morphological similarity we see between the different taxa. Second thing that's shown here is the relationships over time, the phylogenetic relationships. So these are the time axis, but now it's the phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships and that's we are representing by this branching diagram so this branching diagram that we're seeing here is this phylogenetic relationships or the evolutionary relationships between them the monophyletic groups we would see so you can see in terms of just the branching G goes here right just phylogenetically G goes in that position but G has a very distinct morphology. So G does not look very much like the others. And so we move G from its normal position there in the phylogenetic tree, oh, and we put it over on the side, just to represent that. Now, no one actually drew phylogenetic trees in this way, but I'm just trying to make this point that we are placing G over on the side because it is morphologically distinct. Now, let's look at circumscription. And remember, this idea of delimited is also another way of saying circumscribed. So how are taxa delimited or circumscribed? A classical taxonomist would want to put G in its own group. 
So it would, let's say we're creating families. Here is the first family. Family 1. And G is put in its only family. Call it family 2. Okay, so our difference here is that we are not creating our higher level taxa, our families in this case, based only on cladistics. If we were only on cladistics, G would have to be with B, C, D, E, F. We are creating it based on some cladistic information. We're putting B, C, D, E, and F together, but G because it is so morphologically different, it looks so different from the other taxa, we pull it off and put it in its own family. So there are many other ways that we could represent this same thing, but a, ta a classical taxonomist is using both information about evolution and appearance. So evolution and morphology or appearance I'm going to say morphology, are used to create our higher level taxa. And this was applied consistently across many different, many different taxa on these things. And so again, they didn't take it well when phoneticists came along, not phoneticists, cladists came along and said, we will not accept examples like family two here, that is not a valid family. Family two has to be included in family one because it is cladistically correct to say that. Just going to ignore morphology. Well, here's a guy who was uh, very influential in my life, um, Warren Wagner, Dr. Warren Wagner at the University of Michigan. I studied under him when I took this class, and he was a very enthusiastic teacher, and he was very influential in some of the ideas that we've been talking about along here. And so he was a very um, typical example of a classical taxonomist. But he was also a person who was kind of transitory transitionary between classical taxonomy and um, cladistics. So he was, he developed some of the very early methods of cladistics independently of the major contributor to that program who was a German by the name of Willy Hennig. So um, he was a very interesting fellow, a very great teacher and uh, as I say a real inspiration to me to go on in in this field. Here's so he would think about the kinds of issues that we've just been talking about about the circumscription of taxi in just the way that I said. So that you notice, let's go down here, we're going to use red now again because we're going to think as Cladus for a minute, and we see that if we had just a cladistic opinion here, there would be our cut, and we would have to put everything. So there is our cladistic group. So that's our cladistic higher taxa, our cladistic circumscription. But Someone like Wagner would say, look, there's a huge morphology. Again, we're saying that this is phenotypic distance, so morphology is separated here. So these groups would look very different in morphologically, and so they would say this and this have to be separate. Separated. So this would be our classical taxonomy groups. So those are the classical taxonomy groups. There could be other groups that are cladistic and other groups that are classical taxonomy, but you get my idea here. 
classical taxonomists are looking at more information at looking at how the organisms appear, not just the phenotypic distance. Our last slide and our last difference between the two groups has to do with how taxa are, del uh, are delimited also, but um, uh, we're really kind of moving on to a slightly different but related subject here. There was a tendency in classical taxonomy to derive one group, higher level group, for another. Let me write this first and then I'll explain what I mean in this diagram. Okay, so when we look at these diagrams, these are very typical kinds of diagrams that classical taxonomists would um, produce. Um, Wagner had a diagram like this that I, uh, or that he taught off of and that I learned to some extent. I used it as a scaffolding, or used it as a scaffolding to try to understand the groups that we were working with as we were learning to identify different plants and about their classifications, but this wasn't Wagner's one. Um, this one was developed in Bessie, so Bessie was probably the first one who started this, and again, he would have used his dicta to help put these kinds of things together, and so at the base of the tree you found this group, um, the Renales, and this were woody plants, kind of like magnolia. Magnolia was in the Renales. A lot of other plants were too, but they were, you know, were woody plants, with uh, big flowers and many parts per flower and spirally arranged parts and spirally arranged leaves, primitive on many or almost all of Bessie's dicta, and they ended up down there at the base of the tree. And now you see that off of the Renales, there is the Rosales. So this is the group that contains the roses and a lot of other things there, but just think of this kind of as roses for right uh, now because we need something to hang our hats on here as we talk about these groups. Now, what does it mean that there's this line here connecting the ro Renales, the things like magnolia, with up here the things like roses? And I've drawn a little line there, right, so that it seems like it's derived from, but that line in fact isn't in the diagram. My arrow isn't in the diagram. There's just this little connection here. What's that mean? Well, it's not very clear what it means. What's it mean here? The Myrtales up here, um, that's derived from the Rosales, etc. These things come off each other. What's it mean over here? Look at this. There's a, brand, there's, a, there's a break over here between the Liliales, these are the lilies and things, and tulips, that kind of stuff, and the roses over here. We have to go down here to get back to the Renales through the Elismatales. You don't know this group yet. Um, we'll learn them in the, near the very end of the class, I think in the last lab, we'll be do some, doing some of the families in that Elismatales group. So it's not really very clear what these diagrams mean. They mean that there's some kind of similarity. So these diagrams are showing some kind of similarity relationships. some type of similarity relationship. Among higher level taxa. So some type of similarity relationship. Exactly what that relationship is, is maybe not so clear. I mean, what does it mean that the Rosales, which is a huge group of plants, not just roses, but a huge group of plants, is derived from the Renales. I could never figure it out. I asked those questions when I used to learn, have to learn things about these diagrams, and I never one could explain what it meant to me, and the only thing I can figure out that it means is that there's a similarity between the Rosales and the Renales. If we think about Bessie's dicta, if we would find in the Renales almost all of the examples the Renales would have all of Bessie's primitive conditions. The ones that down here would have all of them, then there were a few of them in the 
Roselli in the Renales that don't have them, but it's basically all of the taxi in there would have the primitive conditions. As we get into the Roselis, there would be fewer of the taxa with all primitive conditions. There'd still be some, but now you'd start to see some derived characteristics. There might be some plants in here now which didn't have many um, petals. A primitive condition would be having many petals or didn't have many stamen. A primitive condition would be having many stamen. Here, so they're starting to have some of these groups that have this. And we get up here in the Asterales, up here, we've got basically there's nothing in the Asterales that has um, many petals. There's very few woody groups, woody, woody plants in here. They're mostly herbaceous plants. The flowers are relatively small. The stamen are not. Rosales gives rise to the Myrtales, another order. What does that mean? An order of plants that gives rise to another. It's really not very clear in these organisms, in these diagrams, but it is a very common thing that classical taxonomists would do. Major groups would give rise to one another. If we look back at our phylogenetic tree, you know, and we start to ask the same question on these phylogenetic trees, and we say, well, what is it at this point that gives rise to these other taxa? Well, ultimately, the answer is that there's a species there. So a species is what exists at every one of those branch points. And then there's been an evolution out of that ancestral species to these other groups and things. So you traced back families or orders to a single branch point. But the idea is at that branch point, there was some species that go into what evolutionary radiation to give rise to the other taxa. So you can identify in these branching diagrams, um, these phylogenetic trees, what in theory at least exists at the branch points, whereas in here what exists there it's not at all clear. Maybe it's supposed to be a species or not.